you know, in terms of understanding protocols and how to deal with sin, how to deal with wrongdoing at all levels, how to deal with these pains. We have swept so much under the rug. We have not been listening. We have not been willing to have those hard conversations. We've not been willing to deal with and own our own issues. And it has to start with leaders. So yes, it's gonna start in the pulpits. And this is why the pulpits are on fire. Hey everyone, this is Wanda Alger, and today is Thursday, June 20, 2024. If you are on any kind of social media platform, you have probably heard the news about Robert Morris from Gateway Church in Texas. That was uh, just recently forced to resign from uh, his ministry because of news that has come out about things that happened in his life over 35 years ago. Very troubling uh, news charges that have been brought against him due to uh, inappropriate relationship, although depending upon uh, the terminology used, it was really an assault of a minor over a period of four years, and then a reinstatement into ministry. Uh, I, and if you go on different platforms and you Google it or go on YouTube, you'll find uh, many details, many who are talking about it, doing podcasts about it. Like many of you, when the news first came out, last week, I had a lot of questions. Uh, I've not followed Robert Morris. I don't know him. I've watched a couple of messages by him and have felt that it's been sound theology uh, and seems to have a good track record. So of course, when this story broke, a lot of questions. And even if it did happen 35 years ago, you know, what's going on? Well, a lot of detail has come out since that time and it should cause a lot of questions. It's very troubling. And I had to even stop my own process and really uh, go back and say, okay, Lord, what, what's going on here? And so he gave me a word and I posted it last night and I'm going to reference that and talk a little bit about it because it really is a weighty word that we need to hear as the body of Christ. Then I also want to just talk about the spirit that I see that's driving many of these online conversations that is also very concerning because it's not just the facts that are coming out uh, and the clarification of what happened and what didn't happen. It is the spirit with which these conversations are being shared. And if we're not careful, we're not gonna recognize how the enemy is getting involved to twist things. There is justice that needs to happen. There are consequences to sin. There have been far too many things that have been swept under the rug and that we have not been paying attention to. But even so, we wanna do it in the right spirit. If this is going to be a righteous cause, then we need to do it in the spirit of Christ, in truth, uh, in fairness, with biblical accuracy, with legal uh, protocol, all of these kinds of things. And so I want to talk about that briefly. And the last thing I want to just touch on is a voice that I feel is missing in this whole conversation. Okay. So the word that I released last night, and really the phrase that I heard from the Lord is, no one is exempt. No one is exempt. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take you to uh, my website where you can see this word, and you can uh, get a copy of it here, wandaalger.me. It's on my blog. And the scripture that he uh, brought, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. And then I go in, and I'm not going to read the whole word, but, you know, he's obviously cleaning his house. He, he told us what was coming, but we haven't been prepared for uh, what he was going to be exposing in America's pulpits. And, you know, I titled this uh, video, America's Pulpits on Fire, because we are going through the fire. This is the, the other scripture reference is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 13, 12 and 13. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, the heart of this word that I really felt was it was a reality check, bringing a fear of the Lord, realizing that no one is beyond God's oversight or his correction. 
it doesn't matter uh, of spiritual gifts. And I reference, you know, we've only recently begun to learn that spiritual gifts are not synonymous with favor or blessing. We've had to acknowledge that gifts of power are not signs of approval. Where once we may have exclaimed, but God, look at all the miraculous healings and supernatural signs that accompany this ministry. We now realize no one is exempt. Where we have justified wrongdoing because of prophetic anointing or mass appeal. Oh, we've been humbled. We are learning that no one is exempt from examination and testing. No gift or provision will ever compensate for a compromised heart and no earthly reputation will ever atone for unconfessed sin or evil deeds done in the darkness. And you're probably familiar with this passage in Matthew 7, 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, says the Lord, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. God is serious about his standard and the fires of purification have been lit and they're spreading. The resolve of his response in this unprecedented time of exposures is refuting all our claims. But God, look at the years of impact and influence in the body of Christ. No one is exempt. But God, look at the increase of their message and the increase of souls for the kingdom. No one is exempt. But God, what about all the good they have done? No one. The ongoing revelations of sin in the camp, they will continue. The unsettling news of favored ministers found lacking and fruitful ministries found corrupt will continue because this is what the fear of the Lord looks like. The purifying fires of his spirit are accomplishing the very work we have been praying for, fasting for. It is the fire of his holiness that is burning through any and every work of man that is of the flesh and not of the spirit. These fires show no favoritism or partiality and will be thorough and complete. That which is required to hold and steward the coming outpouring of his glory must be proven. Only those vessels who have stood faithful to his righteous standard will have the proper capacity to champion the coming days of glory and power. Now I go on to share that, you know, this, these fires, they're not just going through the pulpits and platforms, they're going to the pews. And it's not just leaders. It's not just acts of, uh, of sin. It's not just deeds done in darkness. It's the condition of our heart. That's what the Holy Spirit is going after, sanctifying, purging, and it's going to hit, hit everyone. And this is why I'm addressing even the spirit that's driving the conversation. Because as, even as perpetrators, uh, posers, pretenders are going to have to take account for the things that have gone on in darkness, so too will you and I have to take account for how we speak about things, how we talk how we process, how we perceive, judge, discern. It, the Lord is getting at the, the condition of our hearts. He's, he's looking for a pure bride. And so this is, this is a part of, of this uncomfortable season of exposures. As these things come out, uh, you know, when, when Mike Bickle and IHOP first uh, were exposed, I mean, it was shocking to so many people. And since then, so much has come out. But it's been very disheartening to see how the enemy has indeed gotten involved in conversations because, you know, as much as prophecy was involved in that particular ministry, oh, the enemy just loved getting involved in that conversation to then disqualify any kind of prophetic ministry. And many people have taken the bait because of the disillusionment, the frustration, the anger, the righteous indignation as to the manipulation of spiritual gifts. Well, let's just throw them all out. And see, this is what, what's going to continue to happen. As sin is exposed in the camp, it's also a perfect opportunity for the enemy to come in and to magnify those things, especially for those who are disenfranchised, who are sitting on the sidelines, those who already have a lot of questions about the church and the leadership of the church. It's going to be perfect fuel for the fires that are only going to burn, because that's what the enemy's fires do. They burn and destroy. God's fires are intended to purify, to, to make us a radiant bride. 
you know, we're going through a testing and we, we need to come through as gold, but we're being tested not only in our ability to perceive sin and to deal with wrongdoing, but also in our ability to walk through it together with the wisdom of God in truth and in mercy for all involved. And so this really is, is the challenge. Um, so again, you can go to WandaAldrew.me and you can get a copy of that word. Please share it, uh, meditate on it, pray into it because I really feel like it is something that should stir in us uh, a fear of the Lord. This is what we've been praying for. And indeed, we're being confronted with it. The other scripture that came up as I was watching these online conversations was Hebrews 12, 14. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many become defiled. Now that root of bitterness, actually that phrase is taken from an Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy 29, 18 and 19, where that root of bitterness is basically referring to a stubborn heart, a heart that refuses to let go of the past, a heart that refuses to yield or to surrender really to the Lord. And it's that stubbornness, it's that unwillingness to perhaps even forgive or to see another side, or to let go of that hurt or pain, that can yield a hard heart. And then we're not in a position to receive God's grace or to receive his truth. And so this root of bitterness is, is really important to recognize. And for me, as I'm watching these conversations, there are many needed conversations. There is no question sin has been swept under the rug. The church as a whole has had a terrible track record in knowing how to deal with wrongdoing, not just immorality, but now we're talking about illegal activity. I mean, that's another level, not just dealing with adultery and sexual sins, even extortion and greed. But now we're, we're talking about absolute illegal crimes, crimes against children. I mean, it's getting serious. And we have not had a good track record of even discerning the difference and following through with that. Because indeed, we have allowed the gifting and the personas and the mass appeal make that determination for us instead of really sticking to the righteous standard that God's always intended. We've got to come back to that. But we have to do it in the right spirit. And so what I'm, I'm seeing, and depending upon what platform you're on, uh, really a lot of those who are advocating for many of these victims of abuse. And, and a lot of them, uh, unfortunately, it happened with IHOP and it's happening now here with the Morris case because this was a 12-year-old child that was assaulted for four years. This was not just a one-time incident uh, with Pastor Morris. It it was a pattern over several years. And so, you know, these, <laughs> these details are very important in how they're talked about uh, because it will change then how they needed to, how they need to be responded to. And there were a lot of mistakes made from the very beginning of that particular case, uh, that there was no separation between that which was illegal, not just immoral. And there were dec decisions made at that time. This was back in 82, well, 87 when it came out. Uh, they weren't the they weren't good decisions. And now years later, uh, having to pay a, a big price because the church was not ready. To deal with it didn't want to deal with it so this is some of the stuff that we're having to deal with now and my my desire in sharing this is is and i'm ho i'm hoping you're hearing my heart those of you who have followed me for a while i'm not interested in uh you know going through all the details of the charges is this true or is it not and to try to you know be a whistleblower on something i am looking at the spirit behind it because we are in a spiritual battle and god is a god of redemption for all involved, but there's consequences, there's boundaries. Again, there, there's consequences to sin, uh, especially to legal issues, but we have to set some new patterns. And so we have to know that we are in a, in a right place. We can have a righteous zeal. There is a righteous indignation, okay? And a frustration and it is right and good because when you see these kinds of things uh, that have gone unchecked, then it should cause us to rise up with that anger of the Lord. But it always needs to be unto life and blessing. See, the enemy just wants to focus on punishment, vindiction, vindication. And that's where 
this root of bitterness can come in. And this is the kinds of comments that I, I see. Uh, and most of it is probably on X, maybe some on, on uh, Facebook. Kind of depends upon who you follow. Uh, because there, there is a, a group of people that are, are upset and rightly so. And yet there's, there's also people that have been sitting on the sidelines who have uh, left the church because they've been disappointed. They have been hurt. They have been wounded. And now these abuse cases come up and these charges come. And the enemy just loves to get involved and then to stir up these things and to magnify the disappointments and the hurts uh, and to basically want people, okay, see, it all has to be shut down. Don't trust any pastor. You can't trust the church anymore. And see, these are the kinds of, of reactions that I see. And the reason I'm bringing it up is as you are watching these online conversations, as you are you know, being privy to different details coming out, we all need to have watchful eyes and not just to look at the, the things that are being said, but to always ask the Lord for a discerning heart and spirit that we can recognize, wait a minute, what's, what's the intent of this comment? Uh, you know, is, is, is there a, a grace of the Lord that still sees God's redemption in this? Now, when I say redemption, see, th this is what's making this so hard, people. This is so emotionally charged that even as I'm saying some of these things, I know some of you are being triggered <laughs> because it, it is so easy to hear these kinds of things and to automatically assume uh, there is defense for the perpetrator, you know, that I'm defending a, a, a pastor or, you know, be it Robert Morris or anyone else. And that is not the case at all. But unfortunately, this is the, the culture, the atmosphere. This is the reality of where we're at. There is such a high level of distrust against anybody in church leadership, unfortunately, because of the bad track record and all the press that has been given primarily to the negative. Because there is a lot of good, but of course you only hear the bad. There's such a high level of distrust. It's hard to even have these conversations because it, it's automatically assumed that, oh, you're just trying to protect the church. You're just trying to protect, you know, your friend, the pastor. I mean, I've, I've already gotten those kinds of messages and emails. Uh, and so this is why we, we've got to start turning the conversation that, that this is not about defending a person, what I'm looking at is what are the biblical principles? Where's the spirit of Christ that we can do this right? There are going to be consequences. There are some, there need to be some people that are taken out of ministry. There are some ministries that need to be shut down. There, absolutely. There are victims that have not been listened to. Uh, there are abuses that we need to have both eyes open and we can no longer turn a blind eye and say, oh, it couldn't happen to us. No, we've got to face these hard truths and, and we cannot put a gift or, you know, even years long track record. If there is something that still the Lord is saying, you need to look at this, we need to look at it. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit though about these, these online discussions and some of the things that I see, I, I did want to bring attention to a prayer guide that I actually made a couple of years ago when we were dealing with accusations and allegations more in the governmental realm. Uh, and I made a prayer guide, but when I went back to it today, I saw some things that I thought, you know what, this could really apply. And, and I wanted to share it with you. So you can actually find it uh, on my website. If you go to wandaalger.me, I have a resources tab here. And when you click on that, it's going to bring up all these topical studies. I've talked about this before. I've got tons of information in all these different topics here. If you click on any one of them, it'll give you articles and videos and PDF downloads. But just on this resources page, I even have a, a bunch of links here I've put from the last couple of years you might find interesting. But then I have all these prayer guides. These are just PDF prayer guides that you can download and copy, share, okay, uh, that are, are available. And I've shared some of these before, but right here allegations and accusations, praying for a righteous outcome. Uh, I'm going to point this to you because you can go right now and you can download this. Uh, it's free and, and make a copy of it because I found some scriptures here that I, I wanted to share with you. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, go through them here, but this is where you can get it. Okay. But listen, if, if we're going to properly process, because I, I guarantee you, Robert Morris and Gateway is not going to be the last. We're going to be dealing with this for a while. And we've got to learn how to talk about it without getting triggered. All right. 
So some of the things that I mentioned in this PDF, we've got to test everything that we hear. Philippians 1.9, uh, which basically is talking about discernment. We've got to be able to test and discern what is best, what is pure, what is blameless. Uh, and obviously when you're watching things online, hopefully we've learned by now, just because it's posted online doesn't mean it's true, okay? Uh, and again, the written comments online are such a small part of adequate communication. And so we just really have to be careful in what we read and what we see, okay? Uh, which brings up in the second point that I, I share here is consider the source. What's the source of the information that we're hearing? Uh, and actually, 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit um, of, of this spirit. Well, I'll just say it now. Is there a vindictiveness and just a desire to punish? Uh, a root of bitterness, someone that you can just tell is just angry at the church. Because when you start then labeling every pastor, don't trust pastors. See, that this is the, the church's fault. When there's such generalized statements like that, you just have to back off a little bit. I mean, we can be frustrated because, yeah, generally, as a whole, the church has a terrible track record. And we, we need to get some things fixed, okay? But there are a lot of good churches out there. There are some good pastors who have actually gone through this process in a godly way and have done it right. There are people today who are not in ministry because they things were done right, okay? So, but in this, in this point, consider the source of the information. As we hear different things come out, you know, just again, pause for a minute and ask, okay, is this a reliable source uh, or it, has the enemy twisted some things? What further information do I need, okay? Which brings the third point, you know, we need a valid agreement. Actually, in Deuteronomy 19.15, I like the way this, I'm not sure what version this is from, or translation. One witness is not enough to convict any accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So, you know, as these stories break, for example, again, Robert Morris, initially, I had a lot of questions. I, I was I thought, wait a minute, okay, the enemy's involved in this and just trying to, you know, pick up uh, something to to try to bring down the church. But I waited, uh, and I watched, and actually, I did make a a post, uh, a comment on Facebook to someone else's post, and I got in trouble for it because I was just asking a lot of questions, and I thought, wait a minute, you know, let let's not go down this uh, rabbit hole and just presume guilty until we know all the facts. And that's when I realized just how uh, emotionally charged this whole issue was. So I had to back up. And since more information has come out, there's been some valid agreement uh, that has caused, I think, many more to, to realize, okay, we need to, we need to take a look at this. The next thing that I have on this uh, document is focus on what's true. What is true? What can be verified? Uh, Philippians 4, 8, Oh, was one passage, you know, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, you know, focus on those things. We, we want to pull out the good, uh, not throw out good, even in the midst of uncovered sin. And, and, and this, we, we might not be ready for this part of the conversation yet, to be honest, because we're still so shocked at the bad and the sin that does need to be exposed, those wrongs that do need to be righted. But the enemy's goal then is to throw out any good of any ministry or any minister. And, and I've talked about this before, that even in the worst case scenario of a minister that has been found to be in sin, you know, the, the incredible thing is a, a gift can still operate. God will still use that gift, not because he's condoning that person's sin, but because he loves his people so much that as long as that person is still, you know, ministering, teaching, whatever, God's heart of love for his people, he's going to use that gift. You know, even in the midst of this, I mean, obviously God is hoping that we're going to catch on too and that this sin will, will be seen. But my point is that's, that's God's grace, that there's going to be good that we can hold on to, that we can keep without throwing everything out. We have to discern the difference. Can we? 
Can we recognize that which is, okay, that is sin, that is wrong, that needs to be held to account versus, you know what? That was God's grace in there. <laughs> Even in the midst of this mess, look what God did. And we give God the credit, you know, that this was a work of his grace, okay? Uh, we need to have that kind of wisdom and perspective when we look at these things. And that's seeing through the eyes of grace. And that means everyone. Again, there's no question that because of the recent things that have come out, it's obvious that gifting, persona, marketing, the professional facade of the church has so many times overtaken us. And that's been the deciding factor in many of these cases. And there have been many, many victims that have just gone by the wayside. Their story has never been heard. Uh, their hurt has never been acknowledged. And so, you know, this is what the Lord is doing. And, and we need to stand for those who have been uh, abused and victimized, who have not been listened to. There is a valid place for acknowledging pain. You know, this is true. If you've ever worked in deliverance or inner healing ministry, you don't even need to do that. In any good relationship, in a marriage, okay? Feelings are feelings. Experiences are experiences. If you have a bad experience, that was a bad experience for you and it caused pain. And no one should, you know, try to convince you you shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> you know, every one of us experiences things and the starting point for any healthy conversation to get past pain is the pain first has to be acknowledged. You have to be heard. It has to be acknowledged that that was painful. Now, again, a part of that reality is when you go through any kind of painful experience or trauma, the enemy sees this as a perfect opportunity. See, he's going to get involved in that and he's going to take whatever measure of pain that there is and he's going to magnify it. He is going to fuel that thing and he's going to insert additional lies and half truths to magnify that thing in hopes that it's going to totally shut, shut you down. So part of the healing process is separating out the lies from the truth. We have to recognize, okay, where is that, that pain that is there because of legitimate things that happened and, and they need to be dealt with and acknowledged, but how's the enemy involved? How has he twisted things? I mean, ultimately this is what we want freedom. And this is what freedom in Christ is about. It's getting free of the enemy's lies and deceptions. But we have to start from the point of acknowledging uh, painful experiences and what we're going through. And this really is what I think is the heart cry of many of these who are coming out now and sharing their stories. Uh, obviously, every one of them needs to be vetted because in speaking from firsthand experience, the, the enemy can get involved in this too. Yes, there are false witnesses that can come forward. It happens. Sometimes you can have someone come forward that did have a bad experience, but then it gets blown out of proportion. These things are real. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because it's going to get to my, my final point of a voice that needs to be heard in this whole thing is a true pastoral perspective that looks at everything in, without partiality, without bias in hopes that, that God's grace can come to bring the healing, the restoration, the truth that is needed, the justice that is needed. But there has to be a level of, of partiality with compassion that does that. The courts are not gonna do that. Once you get the legal system involved, there, there's no mercy. Okay, it's all about punishment. And in today's court system, I can tell you again firsthand, uh, depending upon who, is that prosecutor in that city or who are those local judges? Listen, especially in today's climate, there are plenty within the legal system that have a vendetta against the church, against any believer. And, you know, in terms of fairness, I mean, they can try to claim it as some kind of legal proceeding. I can just tell you it is a minefield. There's no easy answers here. And I don't say that to disqualify anyone from going to the to the courts if it is a legal case. I'm simply saying these are the challenges that we have. And from a pastoral perspective, these are the challenges we've walked through. And we've seen people absolutely destroyed by prosecutors and judges who dealt very unfairly. 
I mean, they, they manipulated the laws. I mean, talk about extremes, talk about manipulating spiritual gifts. See, the, the legal system, they do the same thing. They will manipulate laws to absolutely punish and destroy someone that that individual, that individual prosecutor or that judge doesn't like. It happens on all fronts. This is why we need, we need the Holy Spirit involved in this. We've got to have God's heart and mercy because we're, we're really messed up, you know, in terms of understanding protocols and how to deal with sin, how to deal with wrongdoing at all levels, how to deal with these pains. We have swept so much under the rug. We have not been listening. We have not been willing to have those hard conversations. We've not been willing to deal with and own our own issues. And it has to start with leaders. So yes, it's going to start in the pulpits. And this is why the pulpits are on fire. God is going after the leaders because we're the ones that are supposed to be setting that example of being willing to acknowledge our wrongdoing. We can't short short step it. And we can't, there's no fast track to ministry. You can't overlook sin. It will come back. It's obvious. I mean, this is where why the Lord is saying no one is exempt. If, if there hasn't been anything that has been swept under the rug, it will come into the light. Because what is coming? The glory of the Lord that's going to be poured out He's looking, there's got to be pure vessels that can contain it and steward it. He's not going to allow for any in his house to steward this, this new wine when there's contamination in the house. He's purifying us. And we, we've got to let, let him do that. And that means we're all going to be tested in it. Not only those who are leading, those who are teaching, who have ministries. Yeah, there, there's going to be more of this. And we're going to have to exercise a lot of grace to... Be willing to be circumspect, to ask the right questions, to be willing to look at things through the eyes of love, but also through the eyes of law. Pray for everybody involved. Pray for those who have been victimized, that they will be heard. But God, we, we need his help. We need his help so that we, we fix these systems. Some of it is systemic within the church, how we have dealt with things, how we have put people on, on platforms. Uh, and, and idolized, you know, these platforms and, and ministries, it's coming down. It is coming down. And, and he is bringing this fire, but it's in order to prove what's inside our hearts, because even the motivations of the hearts are being purged. So, you know, I say this at all levels, not only for those who are leading pastors, teachers, but those who are even advocating for now, many who are coming forward with horrendous stories of pain and abuse, we all have to walk circumspectly. If we really want this to be a righteous cause and to see God's justice, then we have to be impartial. You know, James 3.17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, and sincere. I mean, that's that's a pretty long list. Again, it does not mean that we overlook sin, but it means that we have to have the mind of Christ, the heart of God, where we're willing to, to look at, at things. And our aim, see God's aim, when, when God is in the process, when he is a part of the process, he brings life. It's going to bring life and it's going to bring hope. It's to that end. The enemy wants to burn up and destroy. The enemy wants to defame the bride. And see, this is, this is the overarching, and I'm going to conclude with this thought. God is, is preparing his bride. There is a witness and testimony of the bride of Christ that the world desperately needs to hear. That's what the enemy is going after. He's going after the testimony. He wants to defame the bride, defile the bride. And so even how we talk about these kinds of cases, it reverberates in the spirit. And if we curse the church, if we curse leadership, we're cursing his bride. That's not God's heart. Yes, we need to separate out the pure from the impure, to profane from that which is righteous. But we can do so in a way that honors Christ, that honors the body and bride of Christ, and that we can contend together that we would become that radiant bride, that there would be a testimony of a holy priesthood in his house, because he has given us authority. The enemy wants to strip us of authority. The enemy wants to strip pastors. That's that's the whole intent behind this. If, if you can you know, curse enough pastors 
and, and so cause people to distrust pastors. We, we don't have the spiritual authority that God intended. I mean, it's hard to even talk about spiritual authority anymore because it triggers people. They immediately hear control. So you can see these conversations. We need to have them in the days to come. Contending for the same thing, the purity of the bride, the oneness of spirit. I've been talking about this. The unity uh, among us as believers, that we're contending for the same thing for the right reasons. You know, and, and praying for those who are walking through, especially these kinds of stories. Grace, grace, that there will be healing. There will be freedom that there will be justice, laws will be established, protocols will be established, the church can get healthy, and we can start new patterns of doing it right. It's to this end. So I hope you hear my heart in this, and I, I do pray, because I know many of you are going to be commenting, and I'm just going to challenge you as you write and as you read, can we do so in a right spirit? That our hope and our aim is to have the mind of Christ. Yes, we want truth. Yes, we want justice but that we speak of it in such a way that it draws people upwards to see what God wants to do in it. That, that for the name of Christ, for the sake of those who are still lost, who their only hope is in Christ, their only hope is to become a part of this household of faith, the family of God. That's the testimony that, that the Lord wants us to preserve and to protect together. That, that the name of Christ will not be defamed, but that we can together let the world know it's in Christ that healing is found. It is in Christ that freedom comes. And yes, it is through Christ that justice can be served. That's the heart of Christ. He alone can do it. So go to wandaalger.me and download that PDF. There's other prayer guides uh, that you can get. And uh, thank you for your comments, for your prayers here. I pray that we walk in the fear of the Lord in the days to come. As things continue to come out, God is doing a work. And I pray that a glorious bride will come through on the other end. Amen. <laughs>